Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, the Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire, and Episode 24, Enter the Rus, Part 1. Today I would like to thank Zachary for his donation via PayPal, and our new Boyarina, Juliet, for signing up on Patreon. And thank you to anyone supporting the podcast by sharing with friends or leaving a review. The end of the year is in sight, and we are approaching a watershed in the podcast. Last episode, we heard how Scandinavian adventurers travelled into the east to trade with the Finno-Ugrian peoples of the northern forest and established their first outposts on the lakes and waterways. Over the next few episodes to finish up the year, we will look at where the Rus first appeared, that is, where they ceased to be Scandinavian adventurers travelling east for profit, and settled and mixed with the local population to form a new policy. Then we will consider their relationship with the steppe peoples and central and southern Volga, and why they were unable to expand in that direction, and we will then turn to their relationship with the South, especially the Slavs and other neighbours to the West. Finally, we will look at Rurik and the origins of the Rurikid dynasty. Did he even exist? What do we actually know about the first rulers of Rus? Plus a couple of member episodes, and a special episode if I can get the interview scheduled. And that, dear listeners will finally bring to an end the period where we are groping blindly in the dark, attempting to reconstruct what happened from archaeology and foreign reports, and bring us into the bright sunlit age of written history, kings and princes we know definitely actually existed, when they were born, when they died, and all kinds of other exciting details. I should make another note about nomenclature here, as so far I've been a bit casual. So I'm generally using Scandinavian to mean people originating and travelling from Scandinavia to the east to trade and raid. I'm going to be using Rus to mean people that have settled in the east and are creating a new polity there. They are mostly of Scandinavian origin, but there is plenty of mixing with the indigenous population from the very beginning, and the Rus are not by any means ethnically exclusive. Obviously, these two categories will overlap to some degree for a while. Scandinavians did not stop travelling east just because someone else had decided to settle down, and it was natural for the movement to continue and for the Rus and Scandinavians to have dealings with each other. As we shall see, the Rus were part of the wider Scandinavian world, which at this time stretched from the Volga to Iceland, Britain and Ireland. Varangians is a term that only appears later, well after what we are looking at here, only once the Rus are well established. It is used primarily to refer to warriors, usually part of a war band, who typically travel around and undertake paid military service for various rulers, from the many princes of Rus to the emperor in Constantinople. It is this activity that earns them the name rather than any kind of ethnic origin, and the Varangians included Scandinavians, Rus, Finnic and Turkic people who had joined with the Rus, and others such as the English. So at this point in our story we are not going to look at the Varangians. So, in this episode we look at the first part of how we got from those Scandinavian adventurers to the Rus as an expanding power. And this means asking two basic questions, who and where. You might think that when should be one of those questions too, but the when is fairly clear, at least as far as the period when it happened, rather than the Rus appeared at 11.32 on Tuesday 4th October 821. As discussed in the previous episode, those first Scandinavian traces at Stare Ladaga in Sarsky Fort and other places in the forest, can be dated to 750-780. So that sets our lower bound. 
the first people with Scandinavian names appear in Byzantine records in the 820s, and coins with Greek names scratched into them dating to the early 800s have been found on the Gulf of Finland. While not absolutely conclusive, this evidence strongly suggests the Scandinavians had made contacts with the Greeks on the northern side of the Black Sea by the early 9th century. Sometime after this, there was a raid at a town called Amastris on the southern shore of the Black Sea. The provenance of this raid is rather controversial, as the sole record is a hagiography of a local saint written 20 years later, and some scholars argue that the raid was a later insertion in the story. Other scholars argue that the whole tale is nothing more than a garbled version of the well-attested Rus expedition of 860. Against this, we can set the assumptions that such raids were natural for the Scandinavians. They were, after all, known for raiding across the known world, and that this was indeed just around the time that they reached the Black Sea. This means that a raid of this kind would have been perfectly in character for them, and so it is quite possible that this is indeed the first record we have of the Rus. And then in 838, we have the arrival in Constantinople of the so-called Rus Embassy, which has already come up a couple of times, the one that Emperor Theophilus sent on to Louis the Pious for assistance in returning to their homes because of hostile forces on the route they had followed south. These men, which the Byzantines identified as Rus, which seems to have been a word that they understood as having a clear meaning referring to some northern polity, Louis claimed to recognise as Swedes and completely discounted their tale. So that gives us the upper bound for the period. Sometime between 780 and 838, a political force appeared that identified itself as the Rus, whose ruler in his dealings with foreign powers claimed the title of Kayan, or Kaganus, as the Byzantines called it, and who sent embassies out to other nations. That's quite a short space of time to go from one trading village on a northern lake to a kingdom, so it's quite possible that we are actually looking at the first steps of what was only a recently formed kingdom at the end of that period. And the embassy to Constantinople was intended to announce this new power and acquire the legitimising prestige of Byzantine recognition and relations, which would also explain why Louis the Pious doesn't yet know who they are. So if we know the when, let's look at the where. There are several candidates for the home base of the Ruskain. Stara Eladuga, obviously, is the first Scandinavian town we know of but also Sweden itself. Rurikova Gorodice, a fortified settlement up the Volkhov from Stara Eladiga, where the river exits Lake Ilmen, and the region of the Upper Volga. You might be thinking, what about Kiev and the Middle Dnieper, given that they would become the centre of gravity for the Rus? But the archaeology rules them out for this period. We'll look at this in more detail in a couple of episodes when we look at the Rus moves south into Slav-populated areas. But essentially, although we have evidence of a settlement on one of the hills that would become Kiev, in the period we are looking at here, it was barely getting started. Some of the dating is controversial, but there were Slav semi-subterranean houses, a walled compound, and a platform or foundation. Whether it was a strictly Slav settlement with the platform serving as a religious centre of some sort, a Khazar fort with local Slav residents, and a tower built on the foundation of the supposed platform, is still disputed. But there is a general consensus that Kiev was not significant at this time. Kiev will undergo a sudden building boom and transformation at the beginning of the 10th century, which is still a little bit ahead of what we're talking about here. 
Sweden is rather the outlier here, but there are some scholars who think it is the best fit for the route of the ambassadors described in the Byzantine sources. A lead seal bearing the name Theodosius has been found at Hedeby, which has been linked to a Theodosius who was the Byzantine emissary to Lothar I. Louis de Pius' son, who was governor of Bavaria from 840 to 842. In this interpretation, he could have been following up on the Rus embassy by visiting Hedeby, which, as noted in the previous episode, was one of the Baltic termini for the eastern routes. Silver dirhams were reaching Birka by this time, and it's believed that the majority of the early trade went via the Khazars so it is possible that the Swedes had learned the term Khagan and might use it when communicating with the peoples of the south. We don't need to take the fact that Louis the Pious declares that he does not know a Rus Khagan at face value. There were various claimants for the title of Khagan, which as you know implies rulership over neighbouring peoples. So acknowledging the title was a political issue and both Constantinople and the Franks only acknowledged the authority of the Khazars. Stare Larga might seem like the primary candidate as the first Scandinavian town in the east, but its openness and lack of fortifications do not suggest the kind of stronghold a new ruler would be looking for. It cannot be completely discounted, though. Most of the settlement has still to be excavated, and so it remains possible that there is something there that could have been an appropriate base for the upstart Khan. Rurikova Gorodice, or Rurik's Fort, stands on what would have been an island in the early Middle Ages, surrounded by the rivers Volkov, Volkovets, and Zilutug. When you hear that ets ending, Volkov, Volkovets, Don, Donets, it means that the ets one is the smaller river or a tributary of the one with the of ending. In this case, the Volkov is the sole river flowing out of Lake Ilmen and a major feeder of Lake Ladoga. Lake Ilmen lies in what is now Novgorod Oblast, and the city of Novgorod is slightly downstream of the site of Rurikova Gorodice. Although most of the site has still to be excavated, the size, at over 10 hectares, shows that it is a significant establishment. In the parts that have been explored, archaeologists have found the personal effects of Scandinavian women, showing that it was a permanent settlement, attracting migration by entire families. It was built as a fortress from the get-go, situated on high ground in the most defensible spot in the area, with ditches dug to increase the water defences, walls protecting the high ground, and ancillary buildings located on the floodable lower areas essentially in a prime position to control both the lake and the string of settlements that were growing along the Volkov from the fortress down to Stare Ladoga. These settlements date to the 9th century, and archaeologists have found silver dirhams, saltive jewellery, cornelian beads, and other items indicating that they were trading with the steppe and the Muslim world beyond it. Iron plowshares have also been found, showing that they had begun clearing the forest and growing their own food, and so were on their way to self-sufficiency. Perhaps most importantly, copper Byzantine coins have been found in the lower strata at Urukova Gorodice. Precise dating is always difficult, but archaeologists are confident that they arrived before the 10th century at a time when Byzantine items are extremely rare in Scandinavian sites. If we look at the upper Volga region, we have Scandinavian items found at Sarsky Fort from around 800, as well as other evidence of long-distance trade. 
although Sarsky Fort was a predominantly Finno-Ugrian settlement, other Scandinavian sites soon appeared nearby. Around 70 kilometers away, close to where Yaroslavl stands today, there is a large site called Balshoi Timeryova on the Kotorosl, a river flowing from Lake Nyera into the Volga. This was a well-fortified site in an excellent defensive setting. Thousands of dirhams deposited in the 9th century have been discovered here, and the burial complex contains women and children in Scandinavian-style graves. In the mid-9th century, another settlement was established on the opposite shore of the Volga at Mikhailovsky, which excavations show had a strong Scandinavian presence. And a couple of decades later, another site was established at Petrovske. These three settlements were all fortified, highly defensible, and in combination they were perfectly positioned to control the traffic out of Lake Nero and along the Upper Volga. Although we are obviously forced to speculate about the location of the Ruskayan because we do not have sufficient evidence as to where he was based, Birka is the easiest of these candidates to rule out. If the ruler of Birka had been calling himself Gagan, it would probably be mentioned in other sources from the Baltic and Scandinavia. And if the people of Birka were calling themselves Rus, then Louis the Pious would probably not have been saying, these aren't Rus, they're just Swedes. We can drop Stare Aladoga as well. Despite its size and undoubted significance as a trading post, the Kagan's base would have had to be a defensible base with military value, which unfortified Stare Aladoga lacked. In contrast, Rurikovo Gorodishe and the settlements in the Yaroslavl area have size, trading links, and strategic significance. Of the two candidates, several factors are in favour of Rurikova Gorodishe. First, the current level of exploration suggests that it developed faster and more extensively in the early 9th century. Second, its position appears to have been chosen to dominate the northeastern trade the Scandinavians had already established, rather than being merely defensive. If we take the story of the embassy being at risk from hostile forces on its journey back, the location also makes sense, as the routes to Constantinople along the Don and the Dnieper were under Khazar control at the time and should have been peaceful if the Rus had already been based that far south. Third, the earliest records mentioning Rurikova Gorodishi note it as the home base of a prince. It is likely to be the Nemogardas, referred to in Byzantine records, and in the tale of bygone years it is referred to as Novgorod and described as a major political centre. When the people of the city threaten to find their own prince if Sviatoslav does not come and rule in person, it is treated as something that might reasonably be expected from a place of its standing. And if you recall the reading from a couple of episodes back, the tale of bygone years itself describes Novgorod as the place where Rurik decided to rule, when the native peoples decided they were tired of chaos and summoned the Rus princes to rule over them. Although we cannot take the tale at face value, the general picture it describes, of Scandinavians moving into the Lake Ilmen region, and extending their influence to the upper Volga and Murom is consistent with the archaeological picture. The first Islamic descriptions of the Rus, which come from the geographer Ibn Rusta, was written at the beginning of the 10th century. It describes the Rus as living among forests and bogs on an island surrounded by lakes. 
The king is known as the Kagan of the Rus. The Rus have many towns and live by raiding the Slavs and selling furs and Slav slaves. This also fits with the Scandinavian name attributed to Novgorod, Holmgather, which means island compound. So there are good reasons for accepting Rurikov Gorodice in Novgorod as the base of the Ruskayan who sent the embassy to Constantinople. But this does not mean that we should accept it as the focus of a centralised state. We are still talking about relatively few Scandinavians dispersed across a huge territory, even if we make the assumption that they were already confederated with the indigenous population, density was still very low. Control over one route, such as a choke point on the Volga, would not stop travellers taking other routes. This was still just the beginning of Rus, and given the nature of the roving bands exploring in search of profit, it is likely that there was significant competition and resistance to authority. The Arab writer Ibn Khurradabih who, as the caliph's director of intelligence, would have been in a position to know whatever the Arabs knew about the Rus at the time, whether travelling merchants visiting Islamic territory or reading reports from outside it, describes the Rus as just another bunch of merchants, like the Jewish Radhanites. He says they went to the Black Sea, where the Byzantine emperor levied a 10% charge on their goods. This may have been an overland route, as he also mentions water routes on the Don and the Volga, where they pay a tithe to the Khazars. His overall description creates the impression of independent groups of merchants operating without any central authority or direction from a ruler. Ibn Fadlan's description of the Rus merchants he found among the Bulgars is fairly similar. Although he reached the Volga in 922, so almost a century after the embassy and 60 years after the Rus army attacked Constantinople, the Rus he encounters are depicted as individuals or small groups of traders operating for themselves without forming a corporation or following some centralised guidance. Despite this, Ibn Fadlin seems to have found quite large numbers of Rus on the Volga, enough for them to have their own established religious sanctuaries in the towns, where they could make sacrifices for successful trade and carry out funeral rites for their dead comrades. Ibn Fadlan did not venture into the forest himself, but he did talk to and observe the Rus among the Volgas. Supposedly based on their reports, He describes the ruler of the Rus as a figurehead kind of ruler, occasionally dispensing justice, which his people would choose to ignore in favour of settling disputes by combat. Shamans are alleged to have had considerable power, including over the Rus Kagan himself. The text includes a somewhat bizarre description of the Rus Kagan living on an enormous throne he shared with 40 slave girls. He never sets foot on the ground, relieving himself off the side of the throne and copulating with his slave girls, irrespective of the presence of his 400-man comitatus in the hall. When he needs to go somewhere, he mounts his horse directly from the throne. He has a second-in-command who commands his troops and fights on his behalf. Most scholars think that Ibn Fadlan invented this description because he lacked actual information, and he takes his inspiration from the Khazar's dual kingship. But it is possible that when adopting the title of Qayyan, the ruler of the Rus could have copied other practices from the Khazars as well. What does stand out in his book, though, is that he thinks the Rus are the dominant people in the forest. He describes them as living in numerous towns and living off the fur and slave trades. In part, this is clearly due to Ibn Fadlan and the other Arab writers not having visited the forest belt themselves. For instance, he calls the slaves the Rus capture in the forest for sale, Slavs, 
But the Slavs had not yet reached the north at this time, and these slaves would have been Finns or Balts. In the period we are looking at, the Slavs were still concentrated in the forest steppe belt, and had only just begun to spread out into the territory north to the forest and south to the steppe. So, the best reconstruction we have, based on a comparison of archaeological finds, Norse, Byzantine and Islamic sources, shows that the Rus first appeared as Scandinavians searching for silver and trade goods in the east, and then began to settle down on the rivers and lakes of the region. They began to present themselves as a new polity somewhere in the northern forest, most likely where Novgorod stands today. They integrated with the local populations and continued to look for new trade routes and better goods, which naturally led to them beginning to assert their authority over new territories and people. And it is that expansion that we will be looking at over the next couple of episodes, starting with the relations between the Scandinavians and Rus and the peoples of the steppe. Thank you to anyone leaving a review or sharing the podcast on your social media. You are helping us to grow. Each episode has an accompanying blog post where you can find maps, images of things we discuss, and sources. You can find them through the link in the show notes or on the website at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. You can get in touch with me via the website, Twitter, or Facebook, or email to hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. Don't forget to check out the resources page on the website for links to further reading and books of podcast guests. These are all books well worth your time, and buying off those links is another way to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye.